Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, another week and another roller coaster ride for the Sea of Red. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt, and uh, not a great start to this week, Matt. Um, well, you know, if you're going to fall on your face and lose a game, you you might as well get all of the suck out all in one shot and, you know, just burn, you know, in a blaze of glory. And that's what the game against L.A. was. Best <laughs> meme I saw on Twitter was somebody who took a, a picture from the Oliver Twist movie and put Jacob Markstrom's face on saying, please, sir, may I have some more? <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Like, it was... Uh, not a game to, uh, remember, um, and, you know, it's just unfortunate that the Flames were in a playoff race where they needed the points, but... So this was, this was the game that we're referring to now on, uh, Monday the 20th, the Flames lost 8-2 to two in LA to LA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of those where if you lose 3-2, to two, like they did against Vegas later in the week, or you lose 8-2... to two, you're still not getting points either way. So to me, it doesn't really matter how bad they were. It, you know, it's unfortunate that they lost. And uh, it, at this point, it really doesn't matter how they lose. You know, like it, they were spectacularly bad in this game. Everybody was bad. You just throw the tape out. And yeah, get... I guess as a Flames fan, it's just the eight, you know, the eight goals against that really hurts in this one. Yeah, by the end of it, I was kind of cheering for 10, just because, why not? <laughs> you know, like we got 10 total. Yeah, you're you're not going to come back on that one, so eh, it is what it is. And, you know, thing, games like that do happen to every team, and, you know, it's just unfortunate that the timing of it. But, you know, say la vie and carry on to the next one. Well, the Flames the next night tried to rebound and were able to successfully do that. They had a 5-1 win against the Anaheim Ducks in the Honda Center. The Honda Center win doesn't feel as good as it usually does, but man, does this one feel good after that 8-2 loss. Well, the the Flames in this one, they just controlled the play. They, you know, they did not really give Anaheim anything at all in this contest and just managed the game well. They were playing a bad team. They beat them five to one, and they did all the things that they needed to do. Like this was an and absolute, it felt like they had something to prove after the night before. Yeah, like this was an absolute must win, and they did. So, you know, it you wish for better against LA, but you know they needed the two points guaranteed against Anaheim, and they got that. So, can you imagine what a mess it would have been if they would have lost this one as well? Well, you, you would have been already, like, we're done at, at that point. And, you know, uh, even now, like, uh, we're basically on life support at this point. And, you know, if it wasn't for the game against Winnipeg on April 5th, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, catching up five points in uh, eight games is a little bit tough, but... Yeah. Flames got goals here from Nick Ritchie, Troy Stetcher, his first as a Flame and first of the year, um, Rasmus Anderson, Elias Lindholm, and Ma Andrew Mangiapane. So scoring throughout the lineup in this one. But yeah, you were right. I mean, this was one where the Flames played a weak team. They've done well against weak teams, but they had to win this. And I felt that they came out looking like they had to win this. Yeah. And it was a solid performance by everybody. They had a mission they did it and you know that was that and then on uh, thursday night they were back in the dome exactly one week after the big win in vegas to vegas the seven to two win on the 16th and this time in the dome the flames weren't able to get the job done a three to two loss to the golden knights at home yeah this was one of those where just too little too late on the execution part uh they were not very good to start this game. Uh, the first 10, 12 minutes, it was all Vegas. And by that time, it was already 2 nothing. And Calgary played better than Vegas from that point on. But it was not enough. And uh, it, it was a patented, you know, early goals against Markstrom. And, it, you know, they weren't his fault. But... You know, uh, uh, the similar refrain of, oh, we're 10 minutes into the game and it's 2 nothing," And 
it's hard to win. And this is a team that I was worried that could make the Flames pay for that. Like, it's so often that the Flames don't come out ready to play right away. And Vegas is a team that I think is very good at setting the pace early in a game that's good at sort of dictating that play right away. And I think we saw those two conflicting, um, I don't want to say styles, but those two things conflicting each other here where the Flames weren't awake, Vegas was, and they took they took the lead early and they decided how this game was going to be played. Yeah, and it was a good effort by Calgary, uh, by and large, to try to come back. They, again, dominated on the shot clock and did all the things that they needed to except get a third goal in. And, you know, this is, you know, it's unfortunate that the flames are in this position because like this effort under normal circumstances you'd be like oh they played really well in this game yeah but and i did think that they did a good job of sort of coming back into a game where they were having some troubles and you know like i said i thought vegas dictated that pace early and i think the flames did a good job at least in my opinion of coming back into the game and um you know staying with vegas throughout most of it Mm mm-hmm yeah, they were right there. They just couldn't quite click it over, which, you know, it happens. It's just, you know, it's unfortunate just timing-wise. Yeah, it was, I don't know, it was not a great game. I feel like this should have been, there should be more to say about this one, I think, than than we have. But I, I don't know, like... I went into this thinking we're expecting a playoff caliber game. And I don't think we got that out of these two teams, but I do think that we did see that the flames are able to hold their own with some of the top teams when they want to. Yeah. And that'll bode well, if they can somehow manage to find themselves in a playoff spot, uh, because like they're likely, uh, just based off of the standings currently, the flames, if they do make the playoffs, they will likely be playing the Vegas golden Knights or the Los Angeles Kings. So it's one of those where, you know, like you're getting a preview if the Flames can actually manage to make it to the postseason of who exactly they're going to be up against. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, they had their last home matinee game of the year, a 2 p.m. game at the Saldome, taking on the San Jose Sharks, who the Flames have fared fairly well against this year. And this game was no exception. It was a 5-3 Flames win. I think this game to me, Matt, felt a lot like that Ducks game where it was a a Calgary Flames team looking like the Calgary Flames team we know they can be against a team that does not look like a top team in this league and didn't play like it here. No, and the three goals that uh, San Jose got was a little bit of a mirage because, you know, like they were a couple of very good plays on the first two goals and they were kind of fluky goals Um, like that. Pass by Eric or Eric Carlson across for the tap in on the first goal, and the redirect by Sturm. Like those were just beautiful plays, and you know, uh, unfortunate defensive breakdowns, but not even really. And no, you got you got beat by good plays. There's yeah, nothing wrong with that. The third one was a little bit of a dumb bounce, but the, that does actually happen, and. The Flames were able to respond with Walker Dewar getting a goal like 30 seconds later, and then Kadri in the third period getting the go-ahead goal and Toffoli getting his career-high 31st goal of the season. And at, Walker Dewar getting in the in the three stars for this game as well. He looked really good in this one. Yeah, well, they were saying on the broadcast that like Dewar was the best player in the game that day, and I, I had to agree with them that he was flying out there. He's really making a case for a guy that I think we all thought when he was signed might be a fringe NHLer that he's probably a full-time bottom six guy. Yeah, it, it looks pretty much like the same player as David Moss was when he came up uh, all those years ago for the Calgary Flames. And, you know, just that bigger guy who's fast and knows where he needs to be to generate offense Um isn't the most talented player, but if he's in the right spots, he can generate offense. And, he, you know, he's playing at a level higher than I thought he could play at the NHL level, especially seeing him a little bit in uh, with uh, the Wranglers and that. Like, he was, it, you know, kind of like a filler guy down there. And, like, when we even brought him up initially, it's like, um, okay, why? 
Uh, but when they brought yeah. him up initially, I thought he was probably brought up because the Wranglers weren't going to miss him too much. But he was a body capable of filling in, you know, on a bottom four role without hurting you. Yeah, and there are some times where guys just play better at the NHL level for whatever reason, and it's like I have an opportunity, I'm taking it, and you know, and Dewar has really made the most of it. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, he's cemented himself as an everyday player for next year. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I would be very sh- surprised if Walker Dewar didn't start at a training camp in a Calgary Flames jersey. Yeah, something would have to go wrong with his play. Um, like, he'd have to fall off the face of the earth in training camp next year for him not to. Well, with that, the Calgary Flames are still outside of the Western Conference wild card. The Flames have played 74 games, which means they have eight remaining. 33 wins, 26 losses, and 15 overtime losses for a total of 81 points. Winnipeg has 85 points, holding down wildcard slot two. And Seattle, 88 points, holding down wildcard slot one. And the Edmonton Oilers at 91 points, holding down uh, the third spot in the Pacific Division. So, Matt, I think if we take a look at that, according to the numbers that I have put together here, it looks to me that the Flames have to pretty much get five points on Winnipeg in order to win. Not just five points, but then you get five points over Winnipeg because we don't beat Winnipeg in either of the tiebreakers. Yeah, and the only saving grace for the Flames uh, with the eight games remaining is that they do play them on April 5th. And if you look at the Jets' remaining schedule, they're playing Detroit, who's a fairly good team. New Jersey is a fairly good team. Minnesota, Colorado, uh, the Nashville Predators who are in the playoff race with them, and us. So six of the eight games are quite tough for uh, the Jets. And then they have two against San Jose, which, and you know. And as if of San now, Jose can get, 74 games. Yeah, so and if San Jose can win one of those two games, that's just a bonus. But, you know, like they, they have a fairly tough schedule remaining. Uh, Calgary, on the other hand, after uh, the show, the next game is up against L.A., which that'll be the toughest of the opponents the Flames play. Then we're playing Vancouver, Anaheim, Chicago, the Jets, Vancouver, Nashville, and San Jose. So other than Nashville and Winnipeg both being in the same uh, dog hunt as we are, like we play five games against really bad teams, and... You know, Calgary, if they can manage to put those five bad teams away um, and they beat the Jets, you know, it's possible. And things have been said this year about the Flames and their travel schedule and things like that. I just want to note here, five of these eight games are at home. The only time the Flames need to go on the road is going twice to Vancouver, once to Winnipeg. So the remainder of their road schedule is fairly manageable i mean on the 31st they're going to vancouver they have a day off on either side of that they go they play uh a back-to-back one night against chicago here the next night in winnipeg that's a fairly doable thing and then again they make a trip to vancouver with a day on either side so i don't think that you're going to be able to blame some of those on a road schedule or anything like that yeah, and like for the you can be team, back in your own bed for each one of those. Yeah, and for a team that's down four points and needing to make up five and eight games, like that's not ideal. And the only saving grace is that game against Winnipeg. They have to win that. Like, just you know, if they don't win that game, they're done, regardless of everything else they do. Because coming into the year, I didn't think Winnipeg was going to be a great team, and I thought looking at that game, that was probably going to be inconsequential. But I think that now could be the most important game of the season for this team. Yeah, and you know, it's unfortunate that on Tuesday the um, Flames are playing LA, who's a really tough team, and well, they just beat play- us eight to two. Yeah, and Winnipeg's playing San Jose, who's lost like nine in a row. <laughs> so, hopefully, San Jose can wake up and win a game. You know, presently on Tuesday, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> do do you know the your old rivals from the Smythe Division a, a little favor there? Um, <laughs> was but, San Jose? Oh, I guess San Jose was around with the Smythe Division. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's one of those where, uh, yeah, like it could look bleak again after, uh, Tuesday's games, uh, where the flames could be down six points. And I think that if the flames are anywhere above six points back of Winnipeg, uh, 
after Tuesday, I think that's a win uh, for the Flames because that's basically the Flames' last hard game. And that's one of uh, San Jose's or um, Winnipeg's two uh, remaining easy games. So, you know, it that's where, you know, like if the Flames are only four points back after Tuesday or even two by some miracle, then, you know, I think the Flames have a very good chance of making the playoffs. It's just, um, yeah, that Tuesday they need to be more than six points back and yeah it's gonna be tough let's be honest here i mean the flames are not gonna go a no this team has only put together three wins in a row i think twice this year yeah oh no and i i'm not expecting them to uh like go like seven and one or eight and zero but you know they do need to be at least six and two and the only good thing is, is that they're playing a bunch of mediocre teams and, you know, they just have to find they, a way to put them away. And yeah, they've done well against the mediocre teams. Recently, yeah. Um, and they just need to find a way. And it's not easy. And, you know, they dug themselves a big hole. And the, and the other thing to remember is we've got Nashville right on our heels too. Like, Nashville's got 80 points, so... Yeah, well, you know, Nashville, not, I discount them only because basically their entire schedule is a bloodbath of all good teams. So that, you know, like if they make the playoffs, they deserve it because, you know, like looking at their schedule, it's hell. <laughs> like there's no easy games for them at all. As of right now, Money Puck in their playoff odds says that Winnipeg has a 77.5% chance of making the playoffs. The Flames 165 and Nashville 72 Yeah. And Nashville's only got the 7.2 just because they have extra games to play. They have two extra games, yeah. And, you know, but, boy, you, you look at their opponents and, like, it, it's just not pretty for them. No. And that that's literally the only reason why, like, their, their schedule remaining is Boston, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Dallas, Vegas, Carolina, Winnipeg, us, uh, Minnesota, and Colorado. It's like, yeah, uh, if you make the playoffs after, you know, playing that 10-team gauntlet. You deserve it. Yeah, you, you, I'll be cheering for you in the playoffs because, boy, did you earn that. Because, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like, that. that's just not fair. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. And, you know, I think the thing I like about the Flames' schedule from here on out is they've got a lot of off time. Like, they've had some weeks where they played a lot of hockey. I mean, if we look now, we're recording on the 26th of March. They have the 26th, 27th off. They play on the 28th. They have the 29th, 30th off. They play on the 31st. They have the 1st off. Um, they play on the 4th and 5th. They have the 6th and 7th off. Like, there's a lot of time here for the Flames to, I guess, have some downtime, maybe regroup as a team and re-strategize. Um, well, the thing is, is that if they do not come out prepared for any of the games, they have absolutely zero excuse. Like, they need to be on the point ready as if it's game one of the freaking playoffs and you know like they need to go and like there is zero excuse and we know they can yeah and like there's literally no excuse if they're they're not prepared for each game like R right now the flames i think i mean yes we need some help on the out of town scoreboard but i think right now the flames are making their own bed and you're right if it, i think if they look terrible against la and vancouver or any of these games really they you know it's their fault they've yeah. they have to they have to win their way in yep no and that's exactly like they just need to find the ways to win like it's you know there are no more excuses you know your season's on the line you know you have to show the desperation of you want it and if you don't then that also says and a that's lot. a good way of looking at this how badly do the flames want this yeah because if they, they're not ready and they don't show up, well, you know, because, like, realistically, they can't have another L.A. game from last no, week. No, they can't. Yeah. Do you play, do you see um, Markstrom and Net for all eight? Maybe the back-to-back, -back, you might put uh, Vladar in against Chicago, uh, but that would be basically the only one. I know you've had the idea of bringing um, 
bringing Wolf up. I don't think that's on the cards right now when you're fighting for your life. Yeah, that. Yeah, it, it, that's kind of throwing the, hey kid, our season's on the line. We're not going to blame you or anything if you should. <laughs> you know, it's like, no. Uh, <laughs> we need to win this one, but no pressure. Yeah. Everything, you're our last hope. <laughs> Help us. <laughs> Help us, Dustin Wolf. You're our only hope. It's like he's Obi-Wan. Um, yeah, I, I at this point, I think you... you We'll talk about the one exception in a little bit, but I think we know who's on this team, and this team's not going to get outside help right now. They've got to, the guys that are here have got to do this. Well, we have a caveat. The Flames we'll did talk just about, sign Matthew Coronado, so they might have a little come, outside of help there. Let's come back to that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't think you're bringing in Wolf, even if the team is out. Like, if, if this team craps the bed hard, I still don't think you're bringing in some of those guys. I think at this point, these flames have to either make it or live with their decisions. Yeah. Uh, well, like I think if the flames are out, say by the last game of the season, I think you bring Wolf up to play that last game just as a reward for his stellar season in the A. You know, just because you know you want to encourage him for the next year and let him know, like, here's what an NHL team is. Oh wait, they're playing San Jose. The night before. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because uh, we were talking about Coronado earlier and somebody made a false, uh, incorrect Wikipedia entry, which I've gone in and corrected, but it said current NCAA team, Calgary Flames. I said, yeah, that feels like the Flames this season. Yeah, the, the, you know, lots of mistakes all over the place and very inconsistent. Yeah, that's about right. Um, but yeah, it's since been, since been corrected. But, you know, the fact the Flames play Winnipeg on the 5th, the Flames play Nashville on the 10th, like those are, if we look at this whole week, those two are the must wins. Yeah. Or not this whole week, but this whole stretch of eight. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those where they just need to keep going out there and winning games. And, you know, like the only truly absolutely must win for sure. Otherwise you're done regardless of what you do is the Winnipeg game. Um, you can't lose that one at all. Um, you know, because it would be a bizarre situation where you'd have to basically win the other seven games, lose the game to the Jets, and then hope for help uh, from other teams, which gets into weirdo land, you know, and would be very much backing your way into the postseason. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, like, it, it's possible. It's just no realistically sane way of doing it if you lose the Jets game. It's it's the most exciting April I can remember as a Flames fan. Yeah. Like, usually for this team, especially last year, April didn't really matter. Um, no. Usually we're either in or out. I can't remember last time that we had the Flames chasing this close to a wild card or a playoff. Well, start. and, you know, and that's part of the, the problem. Like, when the Flames have actually be, been quasi... Um, bad enough like they just missed the playoffs outright and you know which is frustrating and disappointing or they're just so awesome that like the whole month of march and april are irrelevant and so they kind of slog their way in and like that's how they got upset by colorado that one year um and you know uh, didn't really have the greatest series against dallas even though they beat them and like the only time recently ish where they were actually fighting to get into the postseason was in 1415 where that team was you know not good but uh you know they were trying very hard that year and they actually upset the vancouver canucks that year and uh you know played respectably against a very good anaheim team in the second round I I can remember years when I was a kid during the Young Guns era where we were watching the out-of-town scoreboard, but it was more because you were hoping for this weird, unrealistic ideal that maybe the Flames would make it in. Yeah. Basically, where we are now. Um, <laughs> but, but the Flames were never this close, right? No. True. It was always kind of like if every other team lost all their games and Gretzky had to be standing on his head while it was a Thursday and there was a pasta deal of Boston pizza, then we'd make it like, yeah. When you need 20 some odd games to go just the right way, 
then you know then we'd make it yeah that kind of so, thing but yeah, yeah it's it's a weird place for the flames to be like you said they're either usually in or out they're not yeah, towing and, that line and, and you know to be fair like I, I would much rather how would you say i'd much rather this team be hungry heading into the postseason if they do make it um where like they've had to fight tooth and nail just to get there because basically this is round one for them and you know if they can get on to the postseason like they'll already be in playoff mode on puck drop with zero expectations to actually beat vegas or la um so it's one of those where you know all the pressure is off of them because even if they got swept by vegas or la It'd be like, yeah, supposed to be there. Yeah, you you suck. So you know, you're the eight seed. So Matt, as a and I know anything can happen. I know that you know miracles happen. As a Flames fan right now, looking at where this team is at and what we've seen from them, what does your heart tell you? Is this team a, a, a playoff team this year? No, not at all. I think that they fall on their face hard over the next week, but. I think from all the evidence we have, I've been saying that for a few weeks. You're usually the optimist on the show, so I wanted to get your thought. But yeah, I agree. From all the evidence we have, I think these guys maybe win three of eight and they're done. Yeah, uh, I would say three or four. I don't, uh, you know, and it's frustrating. Like, I could see them losing both the games to Vancouver just because, you know. And I think this time next week when you and I chat, we could be talking about a, a week of blanks. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, like after uh, the Anaheim game uh, on April 2nd, um, you know, we'll definitely have a better idea of where this team's at uh, with only five games remaining. And, you know, it it's one of those where if they haven't narrowed the lead down to three or two points by the end of next week, you know, like if it's four after this week of games like that it's gonna get extremely tough to like you basically have to win all five at that point we'll see what the flames can do yeah it's one of those where you know uh, it's really time for this team to show up and if they're they have it in them that will be great and if they play as they have been this kind of off again off again team as they have been all year then that will show too and at this point um frankly uh i'm just as good with them making it as them not making it uh because you know like it it, if they miss the playoffs that will spur a lot more significant changes um you know especially off ice uh, that are necessary um and if they do make it, you know, I hope that, um, you know, they're ultimately successful in whatever they do. Well, um, let's deal with the off season but, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. It's one of those where, uh, you know, there are tangible benefits to the flames either way. It's just, um, seeing how everything shakes out on a recent episode of 32 thoughts, uh, NHL, I don't know if, don't know if they call him the insider, but NHL pundit Elliot Friedman had said, Nazem Kadri has been very vocal about what he's seen in Calgary this season and why they aren't firing in all cylinders. He's been very blunt about communication between the players and the coach and that frustration boiled over on Saturday night. Kadri con- contrasts Sutter and his staff's coaching method to that of Jared Bedard's in Colorado and says the two are night and day. Subsequently, Kadri was benched in the third period of Saturday's 6-5 OT loss to the Stars. And we've seen um, Kadri rebound since then. But it doesn't surprise me that we're... And I think you and I have expected something like this since probably the beginning of the year, that there's some frustration in the room. It doesn't surprise me that this is coming out. It surprised me it's taken so long for this to come out. Yeah, well, and we touched on it back in January where like, I even uh, discussed with you the thought of firing Sutter at that point to get we talked about that for Christmas yeah you know and because it it was readily apparent to us even just as you know us watching the games that there was a disconnect in the team and that things weren't connecting at all and you know like especially um well frankly Huberto 
has not fit in well with Sutter at all. And, like, their personalities just do not click whatsoever. And I think that's a large part of Huberto's struggles this year is that, you know, he just does not see eye to eye with Daryl at all. And, you know, um, like, right from the whole having to use the washroom uh, incident yeah, I earlier. I about that incident early in the season uh you know i think that put a very bad taste in huberto's mouth for you know like he's not that type of person uh where you know and he's a very straightforward kind of guy and so you know to have that be even discussed in public is kind of you know would be off-putting to him so you know, it, and it just, it just, it, it's one of those things where, you know, and like when uh, he went off on Peltier, when Peltier had a really good game at the start of his NHL career, like you could see the Flames kind of tank after that point and, you know, have dropped significantly ever since then. And, you know, it, it seems that a lot of the problems this year has been Daryl's attitude, frankly, and... You know, so like it doesn't surprise and it's me. It's going to be a lot easier to change the coach than change the the new core of this team. Well, how would you say it? Like I look at guys that like Kadri and Coleman uh, specifically, who have gone through and won a Stanley Cup, or in Coleman's case, a couple of them. They definitely know what it takes to is and is necessary from a coaching staff to win. And while Daryl has also won cups with LA. It's one of those where, you know, that was also 10 years ago. And how players play today and respond today is different from then. And, you know, like you had a lot more, well, like look at Tyler Toffoli. Like he did win a cup with Daryl. And, you know, he's able to respond well to Daryl's style of game. But, you know, that's also not and, But everybody. I think that's partly because he's worked with Daryl before. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I think a lot of these guys are not used to that. And I think maybe working with Daryl before where Daryl was probably harder earlier in his career. This is, it's sort of like uh, Mike Tyson. I remember talking to him or sorry, Mike Keenan. Yeah. I remember talking to a guy who played for him in the China KHL expansion team. And I said, um, I won't say the player's name cause I don't know if he want me to say his name, but I said, Oh, what's it like playing for Iron Mike? And he said, he's more like aluminum Mike these days. Um, like, you know, I think Daryl's probably not as hard as he used to be. Yeah, I know. And it's one of those things where, you know, it, it, there is, you know, $80 million tied up in most of the team. And, you know, you look at Huberto and Kadri, like, you know, you have nearly $20 million tied up in those two players. You're, it's impossible to get rid of those contracts. If And they're, they're not attractive contracts either. No, neither and, one of them. No, and it's one of those things that you know you've kind of made your bed, and now you have to lie in it. In terms of those guys are going to be on the team for the next seven, eight years, and you know you're going to need them to actually perform well. Otherwise, you know, like we're basically going to be heading into being the next San Jose, Anaheim. You know, like who's the next Bedard? level you know <laughs> and like just talking about how bad this team is and you know make our shows a lot less exciting <laughs> but you well, know. Matt, if the flames do move on from daryl i have a list of the the other coaches in the nhl whose uh, deals are up at the end of the year tell me if any of these guys would be exciting to you okay dallas eakins who's currently the head coach in anaheim um six out of ten I Peter think he, Laviolette, the current head coach. Oh, sorry, go back to Eakins. Yeah, I think he's a decent coach, um, and he's done a fairly good job with Anaheim. I thought he did a fairly good job with Edmonton, frankly. Uh, that team was terrible, and he actually got something out of them. Uh, but, you know, there are better options, but I also wouldn't be opposed if that's where it ended up going. Really, the... <laughs> My issue with Eakins is he has, if, if we're looking at this team as a playoff team, he has no NHL playoff experience as a head coach. I agree. And I, I think you need, and we talked about this when Daryl came in, we liked that Daryl had um, playoff experience. You can't sort of get your guys there 
if you haven't done it yourself. And I think that's part of the issue that we've, that we've seen Yeah, with other coaches that have come in like gullets and like ward, like these guys don't know what they're doing. So they haven't been able to get them there. So I think if you're going to bring in a guy, you need to get with playoff experience, which brings me to the next guy, current Washington capitals, head coach, Peter Laviolette. I don't think he ever wants to coach in Canada and I've never really been a fan of Laviolette anyway. So he's okay. It's just, I don't think he, it, He's that much different from Daryl in terms of personality. Um, so I think you're just basically switching deck chairs on that one. Yeah, he's a couple of years younger. He's uh, 58. I Yeah, I don't know. I think he's a better choice than Eakin at this point. Yeah, it, it's splitting hairs at that it point. It is. Yeah. And, and the last guy here, the oldest guy on the list, is current New Jersey uh, head coach Lindy Ruff. Yeah, no. Uh, uh no <laughs> no <laughs> uh it, if it was a different era um then i i would i think rough is a lot like daryl where i think they're both probably not 2023 2024 head head coaching yeah guys yeah the the guy that i would actually most like to see if they do move on from daryl is uh calgary wranglers coach uh mitch love actually yeah, and I think and I think a lot of that could be predicated on his playoff run too, because you look at um, you know like Tampa Bay, uh, they had John Cooper on their farm team, and they promoted him when they moved on from their coach, and you know they ended up winning multiple Stanley Cups. You have Bednar, Bednar on uh, Colorado, same thing. They were very successful in the AHL. He mm -hmm. came up. They've been good. And Mitch yeah. Love has, you know, Stockton was awesome last year. The Wranglers are awesome this year. The Wranglers were, uh, frankly, the their roster, they shouldn't be first in the AHL. They're sort of the opposite of the Flames, where the Flames roster says they should be doing well, and they're not. You know, like, they're not an overly veteran-laden team. Um, even the prospects that they have there are okay, but they're not great. Um, you know, like, certainly not first in the AHL, you know, like that you would expect them to be more like middle of the pack, like sixth to seventh in the Yeah, and it's not like their goalie's saving them every night either. No, and like Wolf is great. And I'm not even gonna, you know, go into that too much. Like he's a very good goaltender. But it's not like he's the only guy doing it. And you know, it's not like you have goalie god, you know, just saving the day every game. it's you know He's a very good contributor, but it's not all on him. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm. I, th I think Mitch Love has to at least get an interview. I, I you know, uh, frankly, if he isn't the hire, I'd be shocked if the Flames move on from Daryl. Uh, both because, frankly, he'll be a cheaper hire, and he's had success in the organization, and all of the guys who have come up through the organization over the last couple of years know him and. I could see, though, I mean, we brought up former uh, AHL coaches uh, as assistants. I mean, pretty much all the assistants now, except for Muller, are former um, AHL coaches for this team. McLean, um, yeah. They're, so I could see them doing something. If they wanted to go with an experienced coach, which I'm not against, I could see them maybe bringing Mitch Love up as associate uh, coach instead of Kirk Muller. Have a, a veteran coach maybe for a year from to, to learn from with that ascension plan in place. Yeah, and that's also a possibility. And you could go with, say, Kirk Muller being the head coach with Mitch Love being the associate. Um, if you're looking for a different look to the coaching staff, I could see them going that way as Kirk is head, Mitch is associate, and moving on from Daryl. Yeah. I could even see a scenario where Mitch comes in as the associate, Daryl stays the head coach, and you've sort of got this balance of old school, new school. That's if the also, owners, if the owners don't want to, they've invested a lot of money in a new contract for Daryl. If they don't want to move on from it, I could see that being a scenario as well. Yeah, it, or alternatively, you could see Huska being the head coach with Mitch Love being the assistant or associate, because uh, Huska's done fairly well uh, as well uh, with the team in the past. Yep. Yeah, lots of options there, especially internally. Yeah. 
Well, on a maybe a lighter note here, instead of uh, you know dissension in the dressing room from the veterans, one of the veterans actually that we can celebrate, and that's Michael Backlund, who I talked about last week. He just hit his 900th game as a Calgary Flame, which is something you don't see a lot of these days. One guy staying with a team for their entire career, even 900 games of a career. So yeah, good for he, good for uh, Bax. He joins only Jerome McGinley and Mark Giordano as players in Flames history who've hit 900 games. So congratulations to Bax. And, you know, I frankly hope that he takes over the number one spot on that list and plays his entire career with the Flames. And if he does, even if he plays 900, I think he's got to be a guy that we're looking at as a forever flame or a jersey retirement at this point. Quite possibly. I mean, if he's played 900 games here, he's been a flame forever, so he might as well be up on the in the rafters. Yeah, well, no, he's just one of those guys who's constantly done everything the coaching staff's asked of him, and there's never a complaint really about Backlund's game, other nope. than you know, oh, you need to score a little bit more, which you know, okay. <laughs> and I mean, Michael Backlund is, has been a really interesting guy to see evolve as a flame he came in i think for the first couple of years we expected as a high pick he was going to be a top scorer he wasn't i remember even you and i criticizing backland a lot early in his career and i think he's really found who he is he's not that top scorer he's become a really good two-way centerman yeah and i yeah i think he's evolved his game to stay on the team yeah and frankly like uh i would be shocked if he was not either nominated or won the Selkie trophy this year. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that pretty much he is one of the top three or four defensive players in the NHL with only maybe Patrice Bergeron being better than him uh, defensively. Yeah. And, and, and Backlund also seems to bring out the best and everybody plays it with. Like, I can't remember a year that we've looked at his regular line mates and not been happy with that line. Exactly. Even going all the way back to when he played with Fro Leak. Yeah, no, and uh, that, uh, you know, he he helped Matthew Kachuk the, develop into a star player, and, you know, he's helped a lot of players uh, as they've moved yeah. into the up And he's the a guy that you can put him anywhere. I mean, right now he's the he's the 2C spot. He's been the 3C spot most of the year. You know what you're going to get out of him night in and night out. Yep, and, uh, you know, that's why I would be more than happy if he stayed here for his entire career. I hope he at least gets a thousand games, which is going to mean uh, at least one more year in a contract extension. He has one more after this in his deal, so he can only get to nine eighty two. But I'm hoping he'll at least get to a thousand there. And then on the other side, a guy who we hope will be here for nine hundred games. Uh, news broke just before we started recording tonight that the Calgary Flames have finally signed Matt Coronado. Their uh, top prospect, their number one round pick, thirteenth overall in twenty twenty one who has been playing in Harvard. He signed a three-year entry-level deal with a $925,000 cap hit for three years. And he will, it has been announced as well. He will be joining the Calgary flames on Monday. Uh, His contract begins this year, meaning he'll burn the first year of that contract. The flames will have eight games left this season and Coronado is eligible to play in all of them. However, Since he was not on the Wranglers roster by the deadline a few weeks ago, he will not be eligible to play for the Wranglers for the rest of their season or playoffs. Which makes sense. So he can come in here, he can play, and I think, you know, joining the team on Monday, which means that he's joining the team before they play again, I mean, they could have him play one game and burn the year, but I think they're going to try and get him into as many games as they can at this point. Well, it doesn't hurt, and... You know, for a team that needs offense, um, Coronado could come in and be basically the Flames version of Cole Caulfield. And, you know, he's a very dynamite scorer. Um, And frankly, I I wouldn't mind seeing him play on a top six role for the last handful of games and just shift everybody down accordingly. Um, You know, see what you got. Um, So where would you put him in in the lineup? uh, Second line right wing. So you would then be putting him with Huberdeau and Backlund. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I right think na- I think him opposite Huberdeau is exactly where I'd like him to start. Uh, just because excellent passer, excellent shooter. You know, let's see. Because I'm figuring that moving forward, um, 
if Coronado sticks in the NHL next season, that you know you're going to want him to be playing with a premier passer because he's very mar- much in the Mike Camilleri mold of player, and him being a right shoot shot right winger, you know, like that just it, you know is tailor made, frankly, for Huberto to feed those pucks. If the Flames were out of the playoffs right now, I'd definitely say start him on the second line. I think, though, with the Flames fighting for their life, I'm not sure I want to put him that high in the lineup for his first game. Um, I think putting him on the third line, which is currently Richie, Kadri, Dubé, would probably be the best place to go. And I think at this point, I'd probably make it Richie, Kadri, Coronado for his first game and move Dubé down to the fourth line, taking Lucci out of the lineup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or alternately, uh, putting Dubé on the left side and Richie down one and Lucic You could. I mean, Richie, I think, has been giving the Flames offensive production in the last little bit that Dubé hasn't as much, so I think I'd keep Richie there. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I... You're I not going to take Dewar out of the lineup at this point. No, and frankly, you know, I, I would just uh, like to see him get all eight games uh, at this point, just because, frankly, if he's in the lineup... It's not going to impact the team negatively. Like, if they're going to lose games, it won't be because Coronado. Um, And give him a proper audition. And because he is a high-impact scorer and the team needs goals, um, where, you know, even if he chips in two or three uh, in the eight games, like, that would be, you know, a a blessing for this team at this point. Where, like, they, because they need every goal that they can get. We haven't seen Jacob Peltier in the lineup regularly for the last little bit, and I think that with Coronado coming in, Peltier might even go further down the depth chart. I'm thinking at this point, uh, maybe it's time to send Peltier back to the AHL. I think he just needs to play, and if he's not playing for the Flames, get him on the ice for the Wranglers. Yeah, alternatively, I could see him drawing in on the fourth line, but yeah, I think that uh, Peltier does need to play a bit. It, it's one of those where I can see it, Benefits on both sides. and just... Obviously, though, Daryl wants Lucic in the lineup. So, I mean, if your fourth line right now is Lucic, Lewis, Dewar, you're not taking Dewar out. Peltier is not really a centerman, so I, I don't know that he fits there. Yeah. To me, I think Nick Ritchie's been a pleasant surprise and has forced his way into the lineup, which I didn't expect him to be on the third line. So I don't think you can take him out. Like, I think where we're looking at this, and for a team that's still trying to be competitive, I think that, yeah, I... I I don't think the Lucic comes out right now, so I think Peltier is the odd man out. Yeah. Especially as a left shot. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, and it's not hard to recall him if you want him again. I mean, they've they he's already been recalled. If they recall him again, does he count as a second recall? Yep, he does. Okay, so they've used two of their four. So, I mean, yeah, I would, at this point, I think I'd send him down and get him going with the, uh, with the Wranglers again if he's not going to play in the NHL. Yeah, I think that they'll probably just let him be up with the team just for, you know, uh, flexibility. Um, even though, like, it, how would you say, it might not necessarily be the best thing for his development during the regular season. They've made but, two of their four recalls, it looks like, so they could still recall him again. Yeah. It's one of those, I think, that the, they're probably going to just run the regular season uh, with both Pelte and Coronado on the team. And then, um, you know, once the flame season's over, uh, put Pelte back down and let him go with the Wranglers. And Dewar probably back down then too. Well, depends. If the Flames make the playoffs, I think That's that true. those guys stay, even as black aces. But Yeah, I, I, I'm i going with what I think is going to happen, which is no true. Flames playoff run. Um, but yeah, no, you're, you're right. If there's a playoff run, they stay here. I don't think there's going to be. So I, I, I would not mind seeing Coronado with Backlund Huberto. I think that's a good spot for him. I don't want to disturb the Lindholm to Foley line and Manjapani. Now, the only thing I would maybe do, I mean, to Foley's having a great year on the right wing. So you don't want to move him around, but the only other thing you could do is move to Foley to the left and put, um, put Coronado on the right there. But I, you don't want to. You don't want to. Yeah, mess I with think a good that thing. you know if Coronado can slide in on the second line with Huberto and that if they have yeah like if they have good chemistry line. then like hell all of a sudden you have two really good lines and you know it, that that 
it could be all yeah. the team needs to win those games. Like, you know, and for sure. And, and even, and even then it gives you some interesting options on the bottom six, whether you go Coleman, Kadri Dubé or Richie Kadri Dubé, and then move Coleman to the fourth, like Coleman's still a good player, but it gives you that flexibility there yeah, to, to play exactly. around. Exactly. And like Dubé uh, with Kadri and Coleman, like that's an exceptional third line. And you know, that can be very dangerous in the offensive zone too. And then the fourth line with, you know, Richie mm-hmm. Lewis and Dewar, like, you know, all of a sudden, like things look yep. pretty damn good. And, you know, it's one of those where, you know, if Coronado can get some chemistry with Hubert O and, you know, cause we saw with uh, the Montreal Canadians uh, when uh, the COVID playoffs um, that one year where he came in and, you know, he helped power the Canadians all the way to the finals and, you know, and, Coronado and Caulfield are not very dissimilar, you know, as players. So, you know, they're both the scoring winger. And, you know, if he can capture lightning in the bottle with Huberto, like Huberto is an excellent playmaker. And if they get chemistry, like all of a sudden things could look very positive for the team. It's very true. Yeah, I think you see, I think you'll see Coronado play all eight or most of the eight. They might not put him in on Tuesday. He was joining the team on Monday. I mean, you know, how many times do we see Phillips get called up and Peltier get called up and they didn't play their first game? I could see Daryl wanting to hold him out of one just to sort of get him acquainted with the way they do things. But I think you'll see him in at yeah. least six of the well, eight. Well, especially it being L.A., I think that um, that might be a little, like, over your head at that point just because... Well, that's why, like I said, I don't know if I'd start him on the second line. Like, if they are going to put him in there, I think you got to yeah. put him in well, the bottom Well, and that's six. where, you know, like, if the Flames are, because they're playing mostly bad teams after um, the Kings mm-hmm. game, where, you know, if they do have like, him, Coronado, on the second line for the rest of the season at that point, you know, like, it, how would you say? The teams are bad that they're playing, so you're not really going to be exposed because the kid's on the second line. Uh, so you know it's one of those like if you lose to those teams it's not going to be the kids fault (laughs) where it you know it hypothetically could be if it was against LA so that's where I could see them skipping the first one but the rest yeah I I think that he could be good to go Matthew Coronado wore number 27 for the Chicago Steel of the USHL he wore number 27 for US in the World Juniors and number 19 for Harvard so 27 is currently taken uh, by Nick Ritchie, so at least for the rest of this year, he'll need a new number. Last guy to wear number 19, Matthew Gachot. Do you think he will don number 19? Uh, I'd give it to him. Why not? Can't flip it around. 91's taken. Yep. I'd give it. And him. for all we know, 27 might be the preference, and maybe he wears 19 for this year, and then or whatever his training camp number is, is actually probably what he'll end up wearing. I don't even know what his training number is, but if he wants 27, I'd, I, it'll be available in the off season. Yeah. He wasn't at the Flames development camp because of the NCAA thing. So I don't... in the past, I'm just looking it up. He's worn 39 for the flames at camp. Yeah. Well, that, that could be my old paperwork. Yeah. It's one of those where uh, that could be a doable. I, I guess. I guess to me, if Pelty is still wearing forty nine, I think he'll probably come in and wear. And we saw Johnny his first year not wear. Yeah, fifty three. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can definitely see him coming in wearing thirty nine. Yep. Um. So I guess we will find out this week. But Matt, that brings us to the end of the week. Um. Let's take a look at the three games for we record next. We've talked a lot about these games now. On Tuesday, the Flames are in the Dome, 7 p.m. start time, taking on the L.A. Kings. Then they play Friday and 8 p.m. start time in Vancouver against the Canucks. And then they're back here Sunday, 6 p.m. start time against the Anaheim Ducks. Yeah, this is... Last week, you thought they'd win all four. What's your prediction for this week? Well, um, I'm going to say that they need to win all three. Uh, I think that they'll only win the last two. But I, you know, I'm going to go with all three because they need to find a way to beat the Kings, even if only just to keep pace with what likely is going to be a Jets win over San Jose, uh, because it'll be tough psychologically. Like if you're needing seven points in seven games to come back from that, even though like the Flames rest of their schedules against bad teams and the Jets are playing basically all good teams, like it's just hard psychologically to get over that. So 
you know, they need to find a way to beat LA. And for sure. Yeah. You know, after that, they, yeah, they just need to win. And because they're playing bad teams, they should. It, so, yeah, I'm going to go three for three and hope for the best. And last week, I had the exact opposite of what happened. I thought they'd beat LA and Vegas, lose to Anaheim, San Jose. Um, this this week, I'm I'm not going to be as optimistic as you were, even with your realistic prediction. I'm going to say they lose to LA and Vancouver and beat Anaheim. Yeah, I could see that. I think having just beat Anaheim, I think that they know they can do it again. It's been a while since the Flames have played the Canucks. Um, and I think the, the Canucks more than a lot of teams on this schedule, just because the rivalry are going to want to play spoiler there. Oh yeah, for sure. And I could easily see that happening. Um, it, it just depends on exactly what the flames want. And you know, the, the playoffs are there for theirs for the taking just because they're playing so many bad teams. So like, it, you know, they have an easy schedule if they want to win and make the playoffs like it, you know, they're not going up against all the good teams. You know, the last time the Flames played the Canucks, from what I can see, was New Year's Eve. Yep. So it, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, they just have to go out and execute. And any way they can get two points, that's what they need to do. And we'll see. You know, it, it's. It, How do you say it? I would say that there's a greater than 50% chance that our next show uh, will be talking about the end of the Flames season. Um, you know, as we're, you know, kind of like just counting down the last five games and, you know, it'll be a somber episode next week, probably. Uh, but you know, the, whether or not that is, will be entirely up to them. At least we'll have Matt Coronado to talk about. Yep. Hey, our new Kenny Agostino, just get a new uh, Italian guy and there you go. <laughs> Better than Agostino. Better than Mon- and maybe better than Mangiapane. We'll see. Yep. <laughs> well, Matt, what's uh, what is um, Matthew Coronado going to hear when he hears all the fans in the dome? As always, go Flames, go! Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.